My guest today is Misha Sher, Vice President of Sports and Entertainment at Mediacom. You'll hear about working with leading brands, athletes, and companies in the brand and marketing industry, as well as obstacles that came with the global pandemic. We will touch on eSport a bit and explain how it's comparable to traditional sport. I'm Katarzyna Dombrowska, and it's simple, you know? Hi, Misha. Thank you so much for joining me today. A pleasure to be with you. So um, we're going to cover quite a bit of, uh, quite a lot of topics today. And I think the most important to begin with is to give everybody uh, the context for who you are and, uh, and what you do and, and why it is that we're actually conversing today. So tell me a little bit about what you do for a job. Wow, what a question. What do I do for a job? So I run a sport entertainment marketing business in, in WPP group. And all, all that it means is that we help, we help advertisers for most part, major brands or smaller brands to connect, uh, connect with consumers through culture. That's really as, 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 as simple as I can put it. So you think about, um, you think about sport or music or film or gaming uh, or any other sort of passion point uh, that people have, what we do is we try to we try to help clients connect with their uh, customers, with people that they want to engage with through you know through their passion points. So that's what sport and ent- entertainment marketing uh, is. You know, aside from that, uh, we do a lot of work with talent. Again, very similar, you know, similar um, uh, type of work where. You know, we help we help talent uh, become more marketable. So, you know, there we're living in a world now where there's so much opportunity for for athletes and for other high profile personalities to connect with people. And um, we understand how how brands are built, what's at the core of something that people desire, uh, what communication must be like, what how people behave on different channels. So. We also work with talent and almost help them build something like a Nike or Coca-Cola or Apple and start to behave and, and connect with people in a more, I guess, meaningful, structured way uh, while still being authentic, but, but having some, some structure and understanding of how you actually connect with people, how you build an audience and how you engage um, in this new world. So I suppose that's... Um, that's a little bit about what we do, and you know, we sit within a major media agency, which means that we have access to a lot of these clients because we plan their marketing and, and advertising communications activities. So we're an extent, you know, we're an extension of that business, and I and I run our offices that we have in North America, in in Australia, in Europe, and and now in in China as well. Okay, that was actually an explanation of what someone does in this industry that's uh, quite understandable. I think quite often people go for the jargon and you don't even know what it is that they actually do. So That's why I try to explain it, sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, so what does your day look like? You got, come into the office, well, maybe not now because I don't know how COVID has, uh, has maybe impacted your day-to-day life, but maybe before COVID, what did your regular day look like? You come into the office, you grab some coffee, yeah. and then what happens? Usually... I get my team together and we go through we go through what we're what we're what we're focusing on. It's different parts of our business. So we have retained clients. Let's say, for example, we're working with Toyota um, on the Olympics, right? So how is our team uh, you know managing you know, managing that process? What have we got coming up? How are we set up? Do they, you know, is there, is everything in place? Do we need any support from different parts of the business? At the same time, we look at we look at our new business because you know we're constantly having to uh, like like every like any business develop you know develop new opportunities evolve our pipeline look at look at how we grow our existing clients by engaging with them in, in more broadly uh, but at the same time looking at looking at other clients in our group portfolio who perhaps we're not working with and and trying to identify you know how can we add value how can we bring value to shell um, how can we we've just won duracell business um, what are they doing? Um, what could they be doing? Where is there an opportunity for us to go and engage with them? So, so sort of a two parts to this. What, what's, what does our day-to-day and existing business look like? Where can I help? Where can we all collaborate you know, to help each other? And then how are we doing our, um, on our new business? 
you know, separately from that, my, you know, my job is to look at how we, you know, how we grow and how do we grow into different markets. So for, for instance, at the, over the course of the past 12 months, we're, we're looking at the Middle East and Asia as real growth opportunities for us now that we have developed really strong businesses in, in Canada, US, Europe, North America, um, Australia, sorry. Where is there an opportunity for us to to expand? So I'm then connected with the senior leadership in you know in the Middle East and in the Far East, and and we're 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 putting plans together on how we're gonna you know how we're gonna launch that. And then another part of that is in, another part of the job is then to look at how do we how do we actually evolve as a business. So we're operating a certain way at the moment in terms of what we do and how we do it, but how do we how do we evolve our capability? How do we do what we're already doing better, right? So are there partners that we can work with? Are there technology companies that can enable us to deliver better services to our clients? But at the same time, are there particular areas that the industry needs that we're not delivering, but perhaps we perhaps we should be? And that's, that's something that's really been taking up a lot of my time, particularly since, you know, since COVID, because priorities evolve, uh, needs evolve, and we have to evolve. Well, as a business, we have to be agile. We have to understand sort of what's going on and 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 how we as a business can adapt to make sure that we remain relevant and we we continue to develop develop our business in a way that can um, that can add value to the you know to the customers I suppose that we're serving in our industry. Sure, I want to come back a little bit later about evolving the business because I I have uh, I really want to pick your brain about that a little bit more. But you did touch on COVID, and uh, I definitely don't want to spend too much time talking about it. But uh, in many industries, it was you know, it was quite a big deal. And I remember that at the eSport Forum a couple months ago, there was talk about that during COVID, uh, advertising and the marketing budgets were were cut. From memory, you had answered that it slowly started to pick up again. And I was wondering, where is it at now? Are advertisers and and marketers happy to blow big amounts of money? Or are they still quite conservative and and concerned about where it's potentially going to go? There's no easy answer to that, really. There are some companies that are that are starting to come back and are starting to and are starting to spend. There are others who are really looking more towards, um, you know, 2021. And how they, uh, you know, on how they come back in in the new year. And the reality, you know, the reality is to be expected that the advertising would be down. A lot of these companies are are selling product, right? So if people are at home, and a lot of the products that they're selling aren't necessarily available online, or if they are available online, it's only a, it's only part of what these companies do, right? So there's still many of them are relying on people going into shop and physically buying. Product, so they will naturally pull back, or, and and they will focus their spending on perhaps more performance-driven marketing, right? So not not so much on brand and advertising, but more on you know e-commerce and and areas like that. So we're starting to see activity. Clients realize that things are things are going to come back in some way. They have to uh, they have to keep active and and, and remain relevant in, in people's lives. But um, you know it's a slow it's a slow process, and it really depends on uh, on the category. For example, eBay, Amazon, and businesses like that, they're doing, you know, they're they're doing really well. But travel or airline uh, industry, then it's a, it's a very different story. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm I can't wait to travel again, but I'm still a little bit. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those businesses are down by nine. You know, some of them are down by ninety percent. I mean, it's it's pretty. Can you imagine any any business being able to survive something like that? Yeah, it's very very definitely. difficult. Definitely. What what kind of concerns do do a lot of your clients have or had when the pandemic was already slowing down and things were kind of going back to normal? Was there any concerns? Was there some concerns that were quite common that a lot of people were were voicing? We obviously had the financial the financial crisis of, of of 2008, but I think in the what this pandemic has has shown us is that we we just didn't know the extent of it uh, you know clearly i mean this is initially we'd go into a lockdown and you think maybe this is a couple of weeks but it would just drag on for months i mean we've been we've been working remotely for for six months and many companies aren't planning on coming back to the office at all this year so i think from from the, from the clients from the from our clients perspective so if you look at if you look at sport in particular clearly or sport and entertainment for that matter you know how do you shift what you know what you're doing because most of the companies that are investing in in these types of areas 
are looking to really connect with people at the heart of what they deeply care about. But if people are stuck at home, they're not going to concerts, they're not going to football games, they're not getting together. There isn't that kind of uh, celebration or that sort of emotion that they can that they can be a part of. So how do you shift and and try and try to connect with people at home? It's a very very different challenge, I suppose, and and not one that they would have faced that would have faced in the past. And this and the the other the, the the broader challenge to a lot of our clients was just around what's the right way to communicate with people in this time, right? So usually. We talk about, you know, whether it's going places or doing things and going after what we want and, and being with people that we love. And you know, that a lot of the marketing is around these, these very sort of exciting parts of our lives. But, but most people are now stuck at home. Um, most people are, so not most people, but a lot of people have a lot of anxiety about their jobs, about their health. And on top of that are, uh, you know, depending on the circumstances are, you know, are stuck, really stuck in, in, in apartments and they've got kids at home. So that you, you have these very difficult circumstances that people are in. So a lot of the companies are didn't really know what is the right way to communicate in that in that time. You know, if you're Adidas or if you're eBay or if you're MasterCard, I mean, would you say, how do you communicate in a way that isn't overtly promoting yourself and, and in some ways can be can be seen as being insensitive? So I, I think there is lots of challenge in, in, in that regard, trying to figure out how, how to actually behave in, in this kind of environment to make sure that these companies were being supportive to the people and understanding of the, of the very strange times that they find themselves in. Yeah, it's definitely a unique situation to, to be in for the whole world. It kind of felt like we were all in this, this new thing together. And you mentioned that... It wasn't sure how to communicate to people. What was your approach? How did you, what kind of advice did you give to your clients uh, and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do this differently or we should look at that. I mean, what, we, what we've said basically is we, we need to be seen as much less about promoting the product or service or anything about any, any kind of promotional type of message and think about how we, how we as a, as a company can be helpful to people in this time. And helpful can be anything. It could be, do we offer some kind of resource? Do we create, I mean, a lot of companies had, um, you know, had, had given access to some of the, some of the paid for services they had, they gave them away for free. So I guess that the, the approach that we took was, let's think about what, what do people really want from us right now? How can we make people's lives a little bit easier at this particular time? Right. So, um, and how can we just, how can we focus less on product and focus much more on purpose? How, are, how do we become good citizens? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that the companies weren't good citizens before, but how do we really lean into that area and do as much as we can at the moment to, um, you know, maybe we can offer, we can offer facilities for um you know for um local health services maybe we can use our supply chain to help with distribution of something but let's look at ways in which we can be part of the solution where we we can put all of our whether that's marketing or production or other types of capabilities our in media inventory whatever it is that we have access to let's think about how what's the best way that we can use this right now to help this situation, to improve what's going on, and and you know just demonstrate to people that you know at the moment it's not it's not about pushing them to our website to buy product, but actually it's about doing everything that we can to improve people's lives. Definitely, definitely. Uh, there was a lot of um, oh, the word escapes me. Uh, oh, cynicism. I think surrounding companies and people's reactions to them around COVID, especially. Can you think of any, or can you give me an example of something that you guys did with, uh, with one of your clients that is a good example of what you were just talking about? As a, more broadly, as a, you know, more broadly as a, as an agency, I mean, not so much, um, you know, not so much, you know, our you know, sport and entertainment business in particular, but, you know, as Mediacom, we have such great relationships and, and really leverage, I suppose, with so many media companies um you know around the world and so which means that you know we can you know whether that's whether that's tv channels or or digital platforms 
And we worked with, uh, you know, we worked with a lot of our partners and our clients to, um, you know, to donate a lot of that, you know, a lot of that inventory to promote national national healthcare services and other types of messages, you know, that were necessary at, you know, at, at that particular time. So you have to take a step back and think about what it is that you have. What are you sitting on? What can you know? What can you offer? And and for us as a business, it is, you know, as a, at the core being a major media buying and planning business, it's the fact that we have, you know, we have the ability to put a message on. Um, you know, the main channels in the UK, for instance, is Sky or ITV uh, or Channel 4. And being able to use that, you know, being able to use that inventory you know, and donate it to companies that need it at that particular time, right? So they can, you know, they can get exposure and perhaps wouldn't have been able to get exposure otherwise. Sure, I get it. I want to come back a little bit uh, to your experience because, as I understand it, a lot of your experience has been in traditional sports, so I'd like you to tell me a little bit about that before I move into what I really want to talk about, which is esports. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, so a little bit about about how your career has evolved uh, in traditional sport. Sure, sure. So, look, my my love for sport was was uh, you know originally came from growing up in uh, you know growing up in what's now Ukraine, was then Soviet Union. I love football growing up. Um, I played it. I played it very competitively from a really early, from a from a really young age, and and I just love just love the game. And then the game has given me has given me some incredible opportunities, both to compete and to and to see the world and and um, and to evolve really as a you know as a, as an individual. So I I I, I owe a lot of my uh, my career just to being able to play competitively growing up. And you know, even though I originally went into banking. Uh, after university, where after I retired from professional football, um, my love was was sport, and I wanted to get back into it. And after getting my after getting my masters in in Liverpool, I ended up I was I was fortunate enough to go into um, to go into sports marketing, and uh, originally working for an agent for an agency based in based in London that was uh, in events and consultancy in around football. Then went to a football club as um, you know, as a commercial director, and then and then after that, uh, you know, very very fortunate to have landed landed a job working with uh, with Pele, you build you know building and growing his brand. So my you're right, my uh, my background is more in 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 traditional sports, but and as I sort of progressed at WPP at Mediacom, um, I worked across a lot of different sports, be that Olympics, um, you know, NFL, NBA. Uh, cricket and and um, and and so on. I just I see um, I see the power of sport. I've been like I said I've been around it at you know as a as an as a, as an athlete myself, but also you know as an executive, I could see the power um, the the power of sport and what um, you know what it can do. I mean, we're seeing this now, for example, in terms of activism and and the role that athletes are playing to elevate. Uh, you know, to elevate issues that we have in society. So, sport um, sport has an incredible uh, an incredible power in society, and that always interested me. And you know, clearly in in the in the realm of in, in the realm of marketing, sport is um, you know sport is very is is very special because it connects and engages with people in a way that nothing else does. Uh, because I think it's the it's one of the greatest equalizers. You know, when it comes to in our everyday life, we could be, uh, you know, rich, poor, white, black, uh, Christian, Jew. It doesn't matter, you know, but when it comes to, there's so many differences, really. But when it comes to sport um, and when it comes to supporting your team, they were, you know, we're all the same. You go to a World Cup or you go to European Championships or any other major events, you'll see, you see the way, the way people connect. Is, is, is like nothing else that, uh, that, I've, that I've ever seen. So I, I, I'm really... I'm a big believer in in what sport can do, and uh, yeah, and I've been very fortunate to have you know to have spent so much of my life um, around sport as a as a you know as an athlete myself and also as an executive. Sport is definitely a, a unique kind of fandom, I guess. A, a lot of brands would would love to have the kind of consumers that 
a big sports team has. How can brands inspire or can brands inspire the sports level of fanaticism when they're not sports related? Yeah, that's a great question. And, 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 and they probably can't. You know, it really depends on it really depends on on the brand but i think the most important um the most important thing to the most important thing to keep in mind to, is you have to think of how you bring value you know to to the fan and to the environment that's the way um, that's the only way that you're going to build you're going to you're going to develop fandom because if all you're doing is basically paying for the right to be seen you're never going to develop the kind of affinity uh, and love that you want um, you have to give re- you, you are you're competing for people's time you have to give them a reason to care so the question i would always put to clients is to say what's your reason for being there why should and if you weren't there tomorrow if we if we left the sponsorship would anyone care would anyone notice so i think that's the that's how you need to approach fandom that's how you need to approach sponsorship if you think about what Heineken do or for what, uh, what Beats do or, or some, other, some other companies that are very successful in, in, in sports marketing, it's because they understand the audience, they understand their own brand, and they understand how they can, how they can actually add something to that, to that environment that doesn't already exist. And they do it in a way that's very unique to themselves, right? So it's not about pretending to be someone that you're not. But, it's, but it is very much about thinking of, of ways in which you can enhance the experience uh, for the people that are already there. And if you're successful in doing that, people will love and appreciate what you're doing. And if you don't, they just won't care and you'll never get the benefits of that association. Okay. I'm curious, when did esports show up on the radar as something to explore? Because for, for a lot of people, even now, when I say esport, about 80% of them think that I'm just talking about sport. They, they ignore the E at, at the beginning. And, uh, and so I'm curious, how long ago did it show up as something for you uh, inside of your business that you were like, oh, we should look at that. This is interesting. A great question. I, I would say probably, if I'm being honest, probably about three years ago. You know, we've been, there's been so much conversation around gaming and esports and I, I think for and and there's still I think there's still an issue around it, an issue of acceptance that this is something that's big and it's real and it's and there are you know it's not just nerds who are playing in their uh, you know in their parents' basement who are you know who are, who are part of this community but actually it's it's global it's people who are well to do they're they're into fashion they're into music they're into they're part of pop culture. Um, so a couple a couple of years ago, our clients started to ask us questions, and what was interesting is the types of clients that were asking these questions. That you would never ever think there was insurance companies and banks, and you think, wow, interesting, they're asking us about gaming. But they they understood that there is something happening in the space um, that they need to pay attention to. They understand that that um, they're in the business of attracting uh, not just retaining their existing customers but attracting a new audience and if you if you watch what what's happening and where that audience is going and where they're spending their time increasingly you know gaming was was the, was the place that kept coming up saying Look, there's a there are lots of people and we're talking millions of people are spending their time playing video games watching other people play video games I mean, it's a whole you've got events you've, it's, it, there's an entire um, there's an entire industry there that you can't ignore. And I think once, um, once we started to see a shift over the last couple of years from what used to be mostly endemic brands, you know, so the likes of, I don't know, maybe Monster Energy or Intel and, you know, and companies like that to Mercedes, uh, Vodafone, Adidas and all these uh, Louis Vuitton, and um, all of a sudden, those types of companies getting involved has really moved the conversation on and has really legitimized in many ways this the entire industry. Because if you have some of the most iconic uh, and admired companies in the world who are not just doing some executions, but they are investing millions of dollars and are talking about 
in the case of, for, for example, BMW talking about this being the future um, of their business, then people are people are sitting up and taking notice, and it's becoming um, it. Well, it has very much become part of the you know part of the mainstream. So it's been interesting for us to you know to follow this and actually, I, I suppose, adapt our own business to make sure that we are that we understand this this industry and we can be very helpful to our clients in this space. Which which uh, which has been I suppose the biggest the biggest shift for us over the course of the past six months. Okay. And is, is, is this a big part of how you're evolving the business? Yes, very much so. Um, we see this as a, we see this as, see this as a major, major opportunity for us. A lot of our clients are interested in the space. They don't really understand it because there are so many different ways in which you can get involved. And when we say esports, I mean, it can make, it can mean a million different things. I mean, what do you, do you mean? Uh, you know, do you mean publishers? Do you mean teams? Do you mean uh, players or streamers or or platforms? I mean, well, there there are there are million different ways in which you could potentially be involved in this industry, and we we understand it well, and we've been working with many of our clients to help them develop a way into this uh, to this community in a way that's authentic in a way that makes sense for their business and in a way that allows them to um, you know to build. Uh, to build a presence um, over, you know, over the coming, um, you know, over the coming years, rather than than doing something that's more executional. How how exactly are brands crossing over from, for example, a brand that was maybe working traditionally in sport, but now they want to venture into esport? Is there anything different they have to do? What, what does the transition look like, or is there one? Yes, well, I guess the biggest challenge that uh, you know, I mentioned earlier about. The, the importance of any companies that sponsor uh, sport, say traditional sport, needing to think about how they add value and, 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 and how they exist in that environment. But in traditional sports, people are used to sponsors. So the, perhaps the, the audience is not as, is, is not as hard on, you know, on, on, on the brands as, as they are with, with the gaming community. The difference is the gaming community is built what it what it is today on its own i mean it's a very it's an, you know it was an organic process so they're very very proud of what of what they've achieved and you know it's very sort of it's very grassroots led and and they don't want to see companies coming into that space just to capitalize on what and what they've built and all of a sudden start to put their logos everywhere and 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 in any way that they can try to integrate themselves into this community and into that environment. So the biggest the biggest challenge that um, the companies have is how do you authentically integrate yourself into this community? What can you do um, that will add that will be seen as 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 um, as adding value? But the difference between gaming and traditional sports is that the the scrutiny is much much higher in um, you know in in gaming than it is in in, in traditional sports. So the, the, the community, if they feel that you're genuinely interested in growing the community, you're genuinely interested in adding something to their experience, you understand, more importantly, that you understand them and what they're doing and how they connect with each other, and you come into it in a way that doesn't interrupt, but rather adds, you add value add value to the games, add value to the, to the watching experience, add value to the community. If that's clear, then they'll, they will accept you and they will, uh, they will champion your products. They will buy your products and, and, and so on. But if they're, if they see that companies coming in as sort of hijacking what they've, what they've built and just looking to use their, you know, their community as a place, as an advertising platform, then the reaction can be quite brutal. So our job is to help clients navigate that space and make sure that they're showing up in, in such a way that feels natural to people who are playing the game or watching the game who are engaging and they, and they, feel, uh, they feel like the companies are bringing something to them rather than uh, interrupting, their, interrupting what they're doing. Got it. Yeah. Gamers, gamers are really an interesting bunch. I'm I'm a gamer, but I'm a little bit of a different gamer, I think, than the, the ones we're talking about. And they have definitely built, I would say, like a closed community. 
in, in a good sense, and they're a little bit suspicious of outsiders, and they, they want to make sure that uh, that you you get them and that that you're uh, on board to to help rather than than just to to cash in. Exactly, because it's because otherwise, you know, why why should they? You know, why should they embrace you? Yeah. Right. They didn't need you. They got you where they are without you. Right. So I think that's and that's and that's a really that's that's a legitimate point. Uh, clearly, commercial partners can do a great deal now to really elevate the industry further and to and to again, I don't I don't think legitimize is the right word uh, because it's it's they don't need anyone to legitimize gaming, but. I, I certainly think when when the likes of BMW and Louis Vuitton and companies like that start to use gaming and gamers in their marketing, that's a great thing for the industry because it it it, it brings more people into you know into gaming. It elevates interests. It means that the from from media to commercial commercial revenue, the industry is going to grow. So everyone, you know, everyone benefits, you know, if, if these companies are coming in for the right reasons. So they're, they're, they're very open to investment and, and, um, you know, and that, and that kind of uh, strategic sort of involvement from, from companies other than financial, but they certainly want, they want to know that it's for real. Yeah. You, you mentioned the word legitimize and I know what you mean by the fact that they don't really need that, but I think what it does is it, it legitimizes when you've got big companies coming in and they want to give you money. It looks different to everybody else. Gamers within themselves, they don't need that kind of, you know, legitimization, if that's even a word. But it makes other businesses look at it as something, oh, okay, this is something we should look at because if they're throwing so much money that way, maybe there's something, something there. We're we're pushing for time a little bit. I just looked at the time and 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 and, and we're pushing for it. So to 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 wrap it up, uh, I want to ask you one question, which is uh, it's more of a personal question, definitely. Uh, but I think a lot of people could benefit from this. Is what advice would you give uh, to yourself? Uh, you know, maybe twenty years ago, or or when you were just beginning in your in your career. Uh, is there anything that you would like to tell the younger you? That's a great question. I think I would tell I would tell myself to to always be always be learning new skills. I think that's the most important. I've I've, I've tried to do that to a degree, but I think if you if at a young age, if at a, if if you're 20 and you've got your whole career in front of you, a habit of learning new skills, some that are you know perhaps closely connected to what you're doing, and some maybe. Uh, less so, they're going to make you more interesting. They're going to make you more marketable. They're going to make you more attractive to you know to companies, and and you, you're going to end up building a you're going to have you're going to end up having as a result a much much bigger opportunities throughout your career if you broaden your horizons. I think a lot of people tend to you know if you work in finance or you work in insurance or you work in marketing, you, you kind of you stay you stay in that you know you stay in that lane you 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 maybe learn uh, some skills that are relevant to that which is great but i think in anything in learning languages learning you know learning other types of skills that um that make you more uh that make you more marketable for uh, yeah make you more marketable i think is is probably the biggest that's the lesson i would uh well that's the advice that i w- i would give myself i I've, I've certainly been doing a lot more of that, um, you know, since maybe over the over the course of the past sort of eight to ten years. But you know, the earlier you can start, then you know the the the, the better the better um, the better off you'll be. You'll never you'll never be worse off by lear- by learning new skills. Yeah, that's that's definitely some solid advice. And on that note, I would love to uh, thank you for for your time and for your wisdom and uh i'm really excited to to see what you guys continue to do in this industry thanks thanks so much for having me i really really enjoyed uh really enjoyed the chat thanks very much no worries thank you